Howdy, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the spookiest debate event of the year, Betty Night Fright, Night of the Living Constitution, brought to you by the Federalist Society's Student Division and the Federalist Society Student Chapter at UT Law. Welcome. Tonight, we'll answer the questions, can a dead constitution bind the living, or has the constitution risen from the dead? Will Professor Siegel live tweet this debate? Stay tuned for the answers to all of these questions and more. My name is Seth Smitherman, and I'm the president of the Texas Federalist Society. Tonight, I'll be introducing our speakers and moderator. But before I do that, a bit about Betty Knight Price. On one Friday each month, the student division is teaming up with a student chapter to co-host a showcase debate. Tonight, we're debating the topic, is originalism a trick or a treat? So buckle up, right into those childhood Spider-Man costumes, grab a bag of your favorite Halloween candy, and let's jump in. First, representing the living constitutionalist and wearing this year's latest magician's designs, we have Professor Eric Siegel. If you aren't already following the professor on Twitter, please do so. He'll provide all the terror any originalist needs this Halloween season. He is a pre preeminent expert on the federal courts and constitutional law and a graduate of Vanderbilt Law School. Before entering academia, Professor Siegel clerked for the Chief Judge Charles Moy of the Northern District of Georgia and Albert J. Henderson of the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. His work regularly appears in the nation's top law reviews, the New York Times and the Atlantic. Most importantly, he has written two books, Supreme Myths, Why the Supreme Court is Not a Court and Its Justices Are Not Judges, and importantly, Originalism as Faith. And in the originalist corner, doing his best impression of a constitutional letter of mark and reprisal is Professor Ilan Werman. He is an associate professor at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, Arizona State University, where he teaches administrative law and constitutional law. A graduate of Stanford Law School, Professor Werman clerked for Judge Jerry E. Smith on the Fifth Circuit after graduation. He has written extensively on administrative law, the non-delegation doctrine, separ separation of powers, and of course, originalism. The professor has authored two books on originalism, A Dead Against the Living, An Introduction to Originalism, and The Second Founding, An Introduction to the 14th Amendment. Last but not least, we have the Honorable Lawrence Van Dyke. Judge Van Dyke is a circuit judge in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Prior to his appointment earlier this year, he has worked at the Department of Justice, and he served consecutive, extent, consecutive stints as the Solicitor General of both the states of Nevada and Montana. Before entering government service, he worked as an attorney in the Appellate and Constitutional Issues Practice at Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher, LLP. Judge Van Dyke, received his law degree magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, where he was an editor on the Harvard Law Review. Before entering private practice, he served as a law clerk to the Honorable Janice Rogers Brown of the United States Court of Appeals. Judge Van Dyke and his wife Cheryl live in Reno, Nevada, where they have three children and yes, many, many guns. At the end of this evening's debate, we will open up the floor for questions from the audience. You must be logged in as a participant in the Zoom webinar in order to ask a question. Please use the raise hand function in Zoom to enter the queue. When we get to your question, Judge Van Dyke will call on you by name and the Zoom host will unmute your microphone so you can ask your question. If you're calling in from a phone, you can press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Now over to our moderator, Judge Van Dyke. All right. Thank you, Seth. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Siegel and Werman for joining us uh, today on our um, and I think this is the second event that we're having like this. So, uh, and it's also uh, Nevada Day today, and I happen to sit in Nevada. So um, that may be why I was asked to moderate this, but uh, it's, uh, Nevada has its, its, nat its state day based on the same day, basically as Halloween. So um, interesting fact there. Um, I wanted to uh, add a couple little facts about my, uh, about my, uh, of our two, two panelists today. Um, for uh, uh, Professor Werman, he is, uh, he, his favorite Halloween costume, even though he's uh, dressed up as, as best I can tell a pirate today, is actually a Roman gladiator, which I thought was particularly fitting for um, today's, uh, uh, I guess, fight night or fright night as we're calling it. Um, uh, Eric's on the other hand, we have, I guess he's a magician. So I don't know what that says about, you know, what, what, what that says about tonight's uh, debate, but, uh, I also did want to, for Eric, I wanted to highlight a couple of things, um, especially his most, what I consider to be his most impressive accomplishments, which is that he clerked for a circuit court of appeals, uh, worked for Gibson Dunn and worked at DOJ, which I think are impressive because they happen to be the same things that I did. So um, in my career, so um, maybe I, I, I lean his way a little bit personally, but because of that, I'm going to start out tonight, I think by uh, letting uh, Professor Werman 
um, uh, lead off the debate. And the way we're going to do that, we're going to have 15 minutes for um, Alon. He's going to start, and then we're going to have 15 minutes uh, with Eric. Uh, and then we're going to go back and forth one more time, 10 minutes each on the rebuttal. And at that point, we'll open up the questions for audience. Uh, they quite, the, uh, they uh, open up the questions from the audience. I think, as Seth said, you can raise your hand if you're technologically savvy and you know how to do that. I think if you're on the phone, I've been told you can press star nine and that will effectively raise your hand so we can um, see that you'd like to ask a question. So um, we'll go ahead and start with uh, Professor Werman. Uh, why don't you head it off? Great, um, thanks so much, Judge, um, and for, to the Federalist Society uh, and Eric uh, for, for joining us and all of you for joining us on a Friday night uh, at 8 p.m. So I have 15 minutes uh, to defend the proposition that originalism is a treat and that it's worth uh, observing and following. So I submit the best way to do that uh, is to ask, and actually, you know, I'm going to, before I forget, I'm going to get rid of my costume while I'm actually doing this. Uh, sorry, there we go. Uh, and the best way to do that, uh, I submit, uh, is to ask, how do we ordinarily uh, interpret law and other legal instruments in our legal system? like contracts or statutes or treaties. So ordinarily, we separate the question of what a contract or statute says from whether that contract is enforceable or that statute is binding, right? So this is, this is what I mean. A, a contract, in retrospect, maybe it was a bad contract. Maybe you entered into a pretty bad uh, business deal. Uh, but ordinarily, we are bound by even the bad contracts we've properly entered into. And Congress, it turns out, may have enacted a bad law. But very much an integral part of our legal system is that we are nevertheless bound even by the bad laws that Congress enacts. Well, why? Why is that? Why are we bound even by Congress's bad laws? Well, because in our legal system, we recognize uh, that so long as the laws are enacted pursuant to a particular democratic process in our case, right, the two represented houses of Congress, the assent of a uh, democratically uh, elected president, that process is sufficient to confer legitimacy on the laws such that they are binding as a whole, right? even those of them we don't like that were enacted by this process as well. Well, my question is, can't this framework apply to the Constitution too? After all, the Constitution is also a law, a law we the people enacted to govern and bind our legal officials. So the originalist position is that we first ask, what does this Constitution actually say? What does it do? What legal effect does it have? What kind of constitutional regime does it create? Now, once we've figured all that out, it may turn out that we don't like all of the Constitution's provisions. Maybe we think it's imperfect. Maybe we think we could do better in some way. But is there an argument that we are nevertheless bound by the Constitution as a whole, despite any imperfections it may have, just as we're bound by the laws of Congress as a whole, even those of them we don't like? So to summarize, for the originalists, I think there are two fundamental inquiries. The first is, how do we even figure out what this constitution actually says or does? What, it, what kind of regime it creates? But once we figure that out, we still have to ask whether this constitution is even binding, such that we should follow what it says, such that we should care what it says or does, right? Especially if we don't like everything it says or does. Well, so the originalists, answer to this first inquiry, how do we figure out what it even says, I think is trivial. I think it's actually pretty easy. We interpret all legal instruments in our legal system the same way we interpret any communication intended as a public instruction. So interpreting the constitution then is in principle, no different than interpreting a recipe for apple pie or fried chicken that you find in your great, great, great grandmother's attic that's dated from 1789 and happens to have been written in Philadelphia. And I borrow this analogy from uh, the, the great Gary Lawson. Well, think about it. If you found such a recipe in, the, in that attic, how would you interpret it? Well, you'd use the public meaning, right? Not a secret or esoteric or poetic meaning, right? It's not a poem. It's not a Socratic dialogue, right? It's an instruction, right? It's a recipe, right? So you'd use this public meaning. And you'd use the original meaning, the meaning the creator of the recipe intended to convey at the time it was written. Now, I always have to say this, that's not to deny the existence of interpretive challenges as a result of indeterminacies or underdeterminacies like vagueness or ambiguity or breadth, right? So the recipe might say add pepper to taste, right? So what the heck do we do with that? Does that vary from person to person, from uh, time to time? Who gets to judge? 
So it will be the case that faithful chefs faithfully trying to implement this recipe for apple pie or fried chicken or what have you will arrive at a range of plausible actual outcomes in the world, right? A range of actual fried chickens. Now, a range, yes, but a range is still a range, right? A range is still circumscribed. A range still has endpoints, right? So a chef couldn't just add rosemary to taste instead because he or she concludes that modern day fried chicken eaters prefer rosemary instead of pepper. I mean, the chef could do that, right? But make no mistake about it. That would not be interpreting the recipe. That would be amending the recipe. Well, you see where this is going. The constitution is also a public instruction, an instruction from we the people to our legal officials. So we interpret the constitution with a public meaning, not a secret or esoteric meaning, right? And we interpret it with its original meaning, the meaning we the people intended to convey at the time we wrote it and sought to bind our legal officials. But again, that's not to deny the existence of those same interpretive challenges as a result of those same indeterminacies. So it, this is an important point. It will be the case that faithful interpreters of the constitution will arrive at a range of plausible originalist answers to many constitutional questions. For what it's worth, I think for too long, originalists defended originalism's virtue as though it's, you know, would lead to one right answer. I don't think that's true. I mean, many times it does. Uh, and I certainly think it's more constrained than the alternative, but I think it's more accurate to say that originalism leads to a range uh, of plausible answers. Okay, well, so that's the easy part. Are we all originalists now? Well, Justice Elena Kagan says that we are, largely on the basis of these kinds of arguments. But that argument is not enough for those who claim that we aren't even bound by the framers' constitution at all, because the constitution is different from ordinary laws. They might say that the Constitution, it's particularly old, it's outdated, and you know, turns out to be exceedingly difficult to change. Well, if all of those premises are true, then maybe we want judges to update the meaning and content of the Constitution over time as a sort of second best amendment process. Now, here's an important point though. I don't think that makes non-originalism a theory of interpretation. I think it makes it a theory of constitutional change. Even, and here's what I mean by that. Even in a non-originalist system, something will get its original public meaning, right? Namely, the judicial opinions. When a judge issues an opinion, the citizens and officers still have to figure out what it allows and what it prohibits them, right? So they'll interpret those opinions with their original public meanings. That part doesn't change. What changes is what source of law we look to as supplying the content of our constitutional rules, the paper under the glass of the National Archives or the papers produced by the modern day judges of, from Harvard and Yale. Right? That, that's sort of the question. Where does our law come from? It doesn't change this question, how do we interpret the legal texts that are given to us? And also this, I think, takes us to the second inquiry. Which law should we be bound by? Are we bound by the constitution? Why should we be bound by the piece of paper under the glass of the National Archives, right, as it's been amended. Well, I claim, and of course I do so in much more detail uh, in the book, is that the Constitution is binding if it is an improvement, and here's an important point, right, because it might not be, what makes it binding might not be what makes the laws of Congress are binding, right? Ordinary law, ordinary democratic processes, it's different from what might make a Constitution binding. So what makes this Constitution binding? Well, I claim, that the constitution is legitimate and therefore binding if it is an improvement of the kind that Madison described in this letter to Jefferson, right? If it's an improvement that forms this debt against the living. He, he claimed this in, in response to the famous Jefferson letter, right? Where Jefferson said the earth belongs to the living, not to the dead. And Madison responded, well, the improvements made by the dead form a debt against the living. And he said the constitution qualified for this. Well, what must the constitution do to be this improvement and to create this debt. Well, I argue that the constitution to be legitimate and therefore binding must accomplish one central task. The constitution, at least for a free society like ours must successfully balance the two principal and competing objectives of a free society. It must on the one hand, create a regime of self-government right, whereby we the people can govern ourselves and choose who we wanna be politically, socially, economically, culturally, and yes, even morally. But by the same token, right, 
This exact same piece of paper, this exact same constitution also has to preserve a large measure of natural liberty. Otherwise, why would we have ever left the state of nature and given up on all that liberty, right? And entered into this thing called civil society. So, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist again to recognize that these two objectives of a free society, self-government and liberty are in tension with each other, right? It's often popular majorities that infringe on the rights of minorities. So framing a constitution that successfully balances these competing objectives is no easy task. My claim is that the framers were remarkably successful for their time at creating a constitution that successfully balanced these competing objectives through ingenious mechanisms, right? Like separation of powers, the checks and balances, the enumeration of power, the bill of rights, the representative mechanism itself. But more than that, much more importantly than that, the framers wrote the constitution in such a way that it would continue to strike a successful balance between self-government and liberty long into the future on both sides of the equation, right? On the liberty side, the rights protecting provisions of the constitution are written in sufficiently broad terms to be applicable to new and changing circumstances, right? This is why the first amendment applies to speech made on the internet. It's why the fourth amendment applies to GPS devices that police officers put on cars, right? Many things that framers could not have conceived of. Well, on the self-government side of the equation, what does the constitution actually insulate from democratic politics? Very little, right? It does insulate, of course, those rights most essential to free societies, free speech, press, religion, assembly, petition, self-preservation rights in the second amendment, and then lots and lots and lots of due process rights. But other than that, the constitution leaves most things, not all things, but most other things to the democratic process, precisely because the founders expected we would evolve and progress over time. Right? If the founders didn't expect it or didn't want it, they would have baked more into the constitution right, than they did. And maybe this goes without saying, but for the most fundamental of regime changes, they gave us the amendment process, which is exactly how it's been used. So it's difficult to use, yes, but we've in fact used it for those most fundamental of, 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 of regime changes. So therefore, in semi-conclusion, or I guess near conclusion, since, I'm, uh, since I am about out of time, it's so long as we the people today Okay, today, not as a matter of blind veneration to the past, but today, here and now, continue to believe, agree, and accept that the constitution of our founders, as it's been properly amended, you know, continues to strike the successful balance between self-government and liberty, then the constitution is an improvement of that kind that makes it legitimate and therefore binding, whatever its imperfections. And let me restate the point one more way, because it's the whole point. It's the whole point. Something must make a, the constitution binding. It can't be that no constitution is ever binding. We know that's not true anywhere. We know civil society will fall apart. So something must make a constitution binding. But we also know that it can't be that the constitution is only binding if it says exactly what you would like it to say in every particular, right? 300 million Americans could have a different opinion about that. There must be some middle ground, some threshold that makes the constitution legitimate and therefore binding even in the face of disagreement, right, over a particular provision. Well, I claim that that middle ground is this threshold success in balancing self-government and liberty, even if it's not the exact balance that you would strike. Now, if I'm right that the constitution is an improvement of this kind that forms this debt against the living, then the constitution I submit to you all is binding law. And if the constitution is binding law, then I submit we interpret it the same way we interpret any other binding law with its original public meaning. I'm gonna stop there, but I have two more minutes. And so I would like to reserve that time, not for rebuttal, which we have a separate time, but I would be remiss if I did not tell um, the panelists and attendees that that book uh, that was mentioned, The Second Founding, An Introduction to the 14th Amendment, which is all about originalism in the 14th Amendment, what was due process of law, what was the protection of the laws, what are the privileges or immunities of citizenship and Brown v. Board? It literally comes out today. It was stocked today, so you can get it on Amazon. It will ship to you in the next week or so. And so I don't know if I'm allowed to do this. We're going to find out. There is a link uh, to the book, and uh, I hope you all uh, check it out, and you can get much more info uh, there as well. And thank you again for having me in this debate, and I look forward to seeing what uh, Eric has to say. That's great. Thank you, Ilan. And uh... Everybody go out there and buy that book immediately, but also stay and listen to Eric. I doubt he probably disagrees with anything, but we'll see if we can come up with something to disagree about. Why don't you go ahead and take it away, Eric? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good evening, everybody. Happy almost Halloween day. 
Uh, it is always a pleasure to debate Iran, and I'm really happy to be doing that. I want to thank the Federalist Society, both the National Student Chapter and the University of Texas Chapter for sponsoring this event, and especially to Judge Van Dyke. Um, and yes, uh, from, from law school to clerking to Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher to get the Department of Justice, all we have to do is get you a job at a law school and you and I are on the same path. So uh, we, we both have life tenure, but you have more power. So that's <laughs> what's going on. I am wearing a magician's hat tonight because I am gonna to try to show in my 15 minutes how today's, at most of today's academics and judges have turned originalism from actually a wonderful democracy furthering treat into a very misleading and very dangerous trick that judges use present company excluded to hide the real basis for their decisions. Um, and I am going to show at the end of my 15 minutes with this magic wand, if people can see it, this magic wand right here, uh, that I'm actually the most originalist person in the room in this event, and much more than Elon is. And that's going to be a heck of a trick, um, but I'm going to do it. So modern originalism began in the 1970s as a response to the Warren and Burger Court excesses, such as Reynolds versus Sims, one person, one vote, New York Times versus Sullivan, federalizing defamation law, and of course, Roe versus Wade, Miranda, and a bunch of other decisions. Now, I'm a progressive. I'm a self-identified progressive. Why do I call these cases excesses? The answer to that is that I am fully in agreement with the very early writings of Judge Bork, the scholarship of a guy named Raoul Berger, and other originalists in the 1970s whose originalism was really more instrumental than an end in itself. These early originalists were all about judicial restraint. And you'll notice that Professor Werman did not use that phrase. Virtually no originalists today use the phrase judicial restraint. They made it vanish. I'll explain why in a few minutes. But the idea that Judge Bork had in his 1971 Indiana Law Review article which is one of the 10 most cited law review articles of all time, really wasn't complicated. And I think the judge might appreciate this. A plaintiff comes into court and says, your honor, I want you to strike down something that the state of Montana did. Or I want you to overrule the law of Congress. Or I want you to strike down something that a governor did. And the question becomes, at that moment in time, what is a judge supposed to do? And that is the only question I'm concerned with. What does a judge do when a plaintiff comes into court and says, strike down a law? And the answer, according to Judge Bork in 1971 and others, was simple. The plaintiff has a very heavy burden of proof to show that the challenged law clearly, and that's Judge Bork's word, I'll read it later, clearly violates either unambiguous constitutional text or uncontested history behind that text. We might call that a clear error rule for constitutional law. And they wanted to apply it across the board. Now, I also want to apply it across the board. I have said that for about 29 years. And I wrote that in my book in 2012, uh, Supreme Myths, Why the Supreme Court is Not a Court. Now, one caveat, I don't think we need a clear error constitutional rule for the fourth through eighth amendments. When the question is, should a confession come into court? Does double, de does double jeopardy attach? Um, is there a right to self-incrimination being violated? If those are the questions, then judges should be kings. But when the question is abortion, affirmative action, action campaign finance reform, and so on, no, lawyers and judges shouldn't be kings. Now, under this kind of clear error rule, virtually all of the Supreme Court's constitutional law cases striking down state and federal laws, I think were incorrectly decided. The exceptions would be Brown versus Board of Education, Obergefell versus Hodges, and the VMI case where a state funded institution wanted to exclude all women. Um, and we can get back to that at the end, but that's because of a textualist approach, not an originalist approach, the constitutional interpretation. Now, a funny thing happened on the way to the courthouse in the 1990s. After 12 years 
of Ronald Reagan and George Bush judicial appointees, the right, when I say the right, I mean Republican Party, conservatives, libertarians, and the Federalist Society needed a new approach to justify aggressive and conservative judicial review. And what they did was hocus pocus. They took living constitutionalist ideas used by judges in cases like Roe and Sims. They gave those ideas different labels and trick or treat, we have something called the new originalism, which might be a contradiction in terms if you think about it. These new originalists in the 1990s, professors like Randy Barnett and Larry Solom, uh, recently of Georgetown, now Larry's of Virginia, and Keith Whittington of Princeton, they came up with, um, I should say they resurrected an old idea. They made a distinction between constitutional interpretation and constitutional construction. And this is what these scholars did. They said where the meaning of the text is clear, in a kind of common sense, non-legal kind of way, uh, then judges should follow it for all the reasons Elon gave. Um, when the text is not clear, then judges have to engage in constitutional construction. And here is the key thing. They admitted that when judges engage in constitutional construction, normative ideological preferences must come into play because originalism simply runs out. And so we get Randy Barnett's strong libertarianism, which is just a normative judgment, uh, informing his constitutional, his originalism. And then we get, and this is hard to believe, Randy Barnett, maybe the leading academic originalist spokesman of our day, agreeing with liberal professor Jack Balkin that Roe versus Wade was correct under originalism. That's impossible. That can't be right. We have a problem right there. Now, please remember, nobody, with one exception, my close friend, retired judge Richard Posner, he's the one exception to this, I have never met anybody who claims that original meaning is irrelevant to constitutional interpretation. That's a straw man created by originalists today um, that no one believes in. Everybody believes original meaning matters. The question is how much? The interpretation construction distinction absolutely embraces that idea. They just have now relabeled that something else. Now, why did these people want to keep originalism as a label in the 1990s when they controlled the federal judiciary, mostly? And the answer is because as a political label, it's very powerful. Mark Levin, the great one who's not, um, said that you know we all have to be originalists. Sean Hannity keeps saying it even to this day. Um, but more than that, this was, a, this was a way of identifying themselves as conservative or libertarian in a way the Federalist Society uh, prefers. But it gets worse, much worse. Not only is constitutional construction without strong deference, just living originalism, and they dropped the deference. That's the important point. They dropped the deference. They dropped the judicial restraint that Elon didn't mention. But these new, these new originalists had a problem. They had to find a way to justify Brown and they had to find a way to justify equal rights for women. So they said, yes, judges are bound by original meaning, even though in most cases that won't decide the case. But even if we know what that original meaning or really what we're talking about here is the application of meaning to new facts. If that original meaning is known but in Professor Larry Solomon's own words, was based on facts that now we have changed beliefs about, that's his quote, then judges aren't bound. And now I'm going to quote Professor Werman from his excellent book. In his book, he says, and I quote, and this is an originalist talking, folks, originalists recognize that original meaning often requires that the application of the text evolves as modern circumstances evolve. He used the word evolve twice in the same sentence as an originalist. But con law in courts is only about application and it must evolve. And if that's originalism, then I'm Casper the friendly ghost. So despite many Supreme Court decisions saying the 14th amendment didn't give women equal rights, such as a decision in the 1870s saying Illinois could bar women from being lawyers, or a decision in the 1940s 
saying Michigan could bar women from being bartenders, despite that we all know that in 1868, women were the property of their husbands. They couldn't, they didn't have the right to vote and they were unequal under the law. And we know the 14th Amendment was not meant to change that in 1868. Despite all of that, Ilan comes out in favor, I believe, of gender equality. How does he do that? With what magic wand does he do that? Well, he says, no, that they were based on wrong facts. And now we know the right facts. Women can be lawyers. They're good at it. But that's horse pucky. Facts haven't changed. Values change. That's what changed. Another um, bizarre phenomenon, a, a example of this phenomenon, where originalists use living constitutionalist ideas, which that was, by the way, they have to judges have to deal with evolved facts and evolved values over time, um, is this new current fad about liquidation. Liquidation is a fancy word for, uh, that Ilan talks about in his book that basically means, it comes from a James Madison quote, and Madison said something very smart. He said, vague and imprecise text has to be fleshed out over time. Well, of course, there is no original meaning whether the president can use drone strikes to execute American citizens having lunch in Yemen if we think they're terrorists, because drone strikes didn't exist. There is no original meaning to whether the 14th Amendment prohibits affirmative action, because the 14th Amendment was passed before Jim Crow, before 80 years of Jim Crow. Go back and talk to people in 1868 and tell them there's going to be apartheid in America for the next 90 years. Then should we use racial preferences to, uh, to help with that apartheid? Well, there's no answer in 1868 to that question. Um, so this is what Ilan says in his book. This is what he says. The first few times a judge has to resolve a hard constitutional issue, he will choose among the competing plausible options. This choice will in some sense be arbitrary. Over time, after a series of mature deliberations made by many constitutional actors, similar cases within that same context will be accorded the same weight, and the matter will be settled. That's common law constitutionalism. That's David Strauss at the University of Chicago, one of the most famous living constitutionalists. That's what he thinks. That's what Larry Tribe thinks. That's what all people who study constitutional law think. The point of all this is that as Judge Bork knew, originalism without strong deference is simply absurd. And it masks the real values that judges are using to decide cases. Um, Professor Solomon's famous for saying the meaning of the Constitution is fixed, and that fixed meaning is constraining. That is the most misleading academic uh, two sentences in maybe the history of legal academia, because both are wrong. The, the original meaning of the Constitution is not fixed if judges can depart from it when facts change, as Elon said they could, and it's not constraining because the facts have all changed since 1868 or 1789. So I wanna end um, by reading something Judge Bork wrote because I think he was right. In this most famous law review article, he said the following. Every clash between a minority claiming freedom and a majority claiming power to regulate involves a choice between the gratification of two groups. When the constitution has not spoken and he meant spoken clearly, the court will be able to find no scale other than its own value preferences upon which to weigh the respective claims. Are we at the mercy of legislative majorities? The correct answer where the constitution does not speak must be yes. That is correct. And no amount of legal jargon like liquidation or other fancy phrases should alter that reality. If we want judges to be constrained by our constitution, there is one way and only one way to do it. And Alexander Hamilton himself said it. And he said it in Federalist number 78, the single most famous pre-constitutional document about judicial review ever written. And what Alexander Hamilton said is that judges should only strike down laws when they are quote, at an irreconcilable variance with the constitution. The Supreme Court, Justice Scalia himself, struck down 130 plus laws, virtually none of which were at an irreconcilable variance with the United States Constitution. So what I am telling you is that's the standard if I was king of the world that we would have, that judges would almost never strike down laws because that's what Alexander Hamilton wanted as did many other founding fathers. 
And with that amount, a little bit of hocus pocus, I am in fact the most originalist person in the room. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, I, uh, Ilan, if you just want to cede your time, I can't imagine you'd have anything that you would disagree with. <laughs> Uh, well, but if, if you want to use your 10 minutes, you can go ahead and use it. Yeah, you know, well, so surprisingly, I think I agree with about 50% uh, of what Eric has said, and the other 50% is maybe a difference in terminology or a lack of emphasis, or maybe it's a bit of talking past each other or, or misunderstanding. So I'll try to, try to try to clarify it. Now, I didn't, I'm not sure I caught everything at the very beginning about the re reaction to the Warren Court, um, but it is a common belief that originalism was a political a development in reaction to the living constitutionalism of the Warren Court. And so I just want to read you some quotes from the founding era. I mean, just to be clear, they were all originalists. Here is, you know, James Madison, a liquidation aside, you know, in 1826, he said, quote, in the exposition of laws and even of constitutions, how many important errors may be produced by mere innovations in the use of words and phrases, if not controlled by a recurrence to the original and authentic meaning attached to them. That was in 1826, Chief Justice Marshall in 1827. Um, I can't remember, I think it was Ogden v. Saunders or something. Quote, the intention of the constitution must prevail. This intention must be collected from its words. Its words are to be understood in that sense in which they are generally used by those for whom the instrument was intended. Daniel Webster, 1840. Uh, <laughs> debating over bankruptcy and whether that included uh, debtor relief as well as creditor relief. He said that the term must be understood in its common and popular sense in that sense in which the people may be supposed to have understood it when they ratified the Constitution. I mean, we could go on and on, but just to be clear, originalism, if anything, is a recovery of what had always been the way of doing law until the legal realist and, and progressive era. So I just, I just want to make clear that it's not an invention uh, as a reaction to, to, to the Warren Court. The other thing I'll say is, I mean, I'm still... I, it's true. I mean, you have to separate out libertarians and conservatives. And I, I have a lot of libertarian friends. I'm sure some are attending uh, this very uh, debate. And so I will, you know, uh, be careful how I cast this aspersion. But it's true that I do think many libertarians, or at least some libertarians, uh, do tend uh, to use originalism as a tool that always leads to their preferred libertarian results. And you should always be wary of a theory that always, a constitutional theory that always leads to your preferred results. Now, maybe they'll come up with some in the Q&A where you know, they'll challenge me on that, <clears throat> but I think it's true. I think, it, I think it's often true. But from the conservative position, people often say, oh, well, originalism, it's just a ploy for conservatives, for conservative results, you know, because they don't like same-sex marriage or they don't like abortion. But this sort of stacks the deck against conservatives in a really unfair way, right? So, so you're liberal if you think the Constitution constitutionalizes these moral questions, but you're conservative if your position is the Constitution leaves such questions to the democratic process, where you might ultimately get a liberal outcome or a libertarian outcome or a conservative outcome. You know, does, does that make you conservative? I mean, that doesn't sound like a terrible conservatism. I mean, if that's true, right? Um, and so uh, I, I, you know, I, I still believe in judicial restraint in the sense of oftentimes the Constitution doesn't answer important moral and political questions, leaving them to the democratic process uh, where either side uh, of the political debate uh, might prevail. Um, I, I do want to say something about application versus meaning. You know, you, you, don't, you don't seem to, to recognize a difference here, and, and maybe the difference is often overstated. But I want to look at two examples, right? I think it's very different to say that a meaning can be fixed, but its application can change, and the meaning itself changes. I think the latter is the non-originalist position. And I'll give some examples. You mentioned the Myra Bradwell case from Illinois in 1873. Well, if you read my book, uh, which is coming out tonight on the second founding, I argue that the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment doesn't actually guarantee any fundamental rights at all. It doesn't even incorporate the Bill of Rights. I might be the only originalist under the age of 60 who believes that incorporation as an originalist matter was probably wrong. I think the Privileges or Immunities Clause was an anti-discrimination provision with respect to civil rights defined under state law, including contract rights, property rights, right, uh, and, and the like. So basically, what is an abridgment of a civil right, right? It's giving one set of citizens more of these civil rights than another, which means you can't arbitrarily discriminate, right? Obviously, you can make some discrimination, right? 14-year-olds can't drive, 19-year-olds can't drink, and so on. So it can't be an arbitrary abridgment, an arbitrary sort of discrimination. Well, I think Myra Bradwell's case was decided, you know, could she be a lawyer in 1873? Well, I think that case was wrongly decided, right? Even then, and so did Sam and Chase, although he was too ill to actually write a dissent. But suppose Myra Bradwell's case was correctly decided. 
that in 1873, it was not an unreasonable discrimination such that it was an abridgment, right? Because as Justice Bradwell infamously said, the woman's place is in the home, right? Suppose in 1873, all those factual assumptions about women were believed and so on. Well, what happens after the 19th Amendment is enacted? Once women get political rights, which are the highest level of citizenship, the highest amount of rights, then doesn't it make sense? Doesn't it follow that after the 19th Amendment, surely they also get civil rights on the same terms that men get civil rights? And this is exactly what uh, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse argued in, uh, I think it was the Mueller case, where, where they struck down minimum wage laws for women, right, which was basically protectionist legislation in favor of men. Uh, and they said, look, women are now fully part of the political regime, which means they get civil rights on the same term that, 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 that men do. So once the legal status of women change, once the social understanding of the role of women changes, it seems perfectly sensible to say the privileges or immunities clause, it's meaning an anti-discrimination provision with respect to state-defined civil rights. That doesn't change. That didn't change. But surely its application can change and can and does uh, evolve over time, right? The application does. Now take another example where I think the meaning has changed. The meaning has changed. Gideon v. Wainwright, right? To our ears today, it sounds like the right to have assistance of counsel means that the government has the right to pay for your lawyer. But that is, doesn't work for any other right as used in the Constitution. Does the New York Times have a right to a taxpayer-funded printing press? Do I have a right to a taxpayer subsidy to purchase a firearm? No, what a right means right, is that if you are willing and able to exercise it, you have a right to exercise it. It. That's a, it doesn't mean you get taxpayer subsidies for it. It doesn't mean other people have to be forced to help you effectuate uh, your exercise of that right. Well, Gideon v. Wainwright is not a change in application. It's not the change of the meaning, the right to have assistance of counsel. To do, it's, it's not applying a fixed meaning to changing applications. It's changing the meaning. It's changing the meaning of the word right in the Constitution, what a right is. That is a move non-originalists make that originalists don't make. And I think that's that's the whole difference, whether the original meaning is dispositive, whether a canon does apply to new and changing circumstances. And so I'll end on, on that point. The, the other thing about liquidation, by the way, just read, read the book if you can, read Will Bode's paper on it. Uh, liquidation only can occur within the range of ambiguous meaning, right? So if it's outside that range, uh, then um, you know it's, it's not a candidate for liquidation, right? So non-originalist precedents would not be candidates for, for liquidation. Much more to say, but uh, I'll stop there. All right. Well, thank you, Ilan. Eric, uh, what do you have to say to that? So by far and away, the most important two words Ilan uttered during that 10 minutes was social understandings. If social understandings change, then the application of the original meaning changes. Well, we're done. We're done. Because social understandings about just about everything changes over time. But even if you don't believe me about that, they've certainly changed since 1868 or um, 1789. Text and history cannot constrain judges. Only deference can constrain judges. And uh, it turns out that Elon was all um, proud of the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote. Didn't stop the Supreme Court in the 1940s from saying Michigan could prohibit women from being barked. And the reason the Supreme Court did that in the 1940s, long after the 19th Amendment was ratified, was because the original meaning of the 14th Amendment is inequality for women, full stop. Now, I don't understand when Elon says original public meaning, there's two, there's two different thoughts in that idea. One is original, one is public meaning. One is time-centered, and one is kind of society-centered. Well, if it's time-centered, then nothing that happens after 1868 matters. It's original public meaning as it evolves over time is a ridiculous sentence to say. It's either the original meaning or it isn't. And the original meaning in 1868 was women didn't have equal rights and we've not passed a constitutional amendment since then. The right to vote did not include, include the right to be bartender or for that matter, lawyers probably. I think Gideon was wrongly decided but Elon also gave another famous straw man. The meaning, he said that, that the non-originalists think that meaning can change, but originalists don't think meaning can change. We don't care about meaning. We care about applying the vague and imprecise terms of the constitution to a set of facts. So here's our test. If I were king of the world, Times versus Sullivan, which is a very, very important case, 
That's the absence of malice for government officials case that everybody's heard of. That was wrongly decided. You can't get there through original meaning. Full stop. I think it was wrongly decided. I wonder if Professor Werman does. One person, one vote in, 19, uh, in, this, in the Reynolds versus Sims case. I love one person, one vote. It's a great rule. You cannot get there through originalism. Chris Green, a mutual friend of ours, has argued that for a long, a long time. I think he's right. You can't get there through originalism. Um, now, those are two liberal decisions. Shelby County versus Holder has to be wrong. Equal state sovereignty is just not a principle that ever existed, and Justice Roberts made it up. Most of Citizen United, Citizens United is wrong. The result was correct, because that case was about a movie the government wanted to censor. The government can't censor movies. That is a prior restraint. That is a violation of the original meaning of the First Amendment. Everything else about corporations and speech is made up stuff by judges that has no original basis whatsoever. And for goodness sake, just this term, when the Supreme Court held that the state of Montana, if it wants to fund private secular schools, must also fund religious private schools, is as anti-originalist an idea as you can possibly imagine when the predecessor case to that a few years ago came out in a much more limited form, a bevy of originals said, this can't be right. There is no such principle, it is just made up. So here's my goal. My goal is to stop judges from making stuff up. I once wrote a blog post called, and I got the most followers of any blog post I've ever written. How do you teach constitutional law in a world where the judges just make stuff up? And both liberals and conservatives, notice how he threw in there a couple of times, conservatives think this, but no, all judges, Scalia and Thomas overturn as many laws as Ginsburg and Sotomayor. They just overturn different laws. If I have two minutes, I wanna make a two minute point. Justice Ginsburg and Justice Sotomayor voted liberal and vote liberal almost every time, in every case we care about. Alito and Thomas vote conservative in virtually every case we care about. O'Connor and Kennedy sometimes voted liberal, sometimes conservative, because they were moderates. They were in the center. Untethered from deference, not originalism, untethered from deference, judges will do what they want to do because they have life tenure and the Supreme Court's case, they can't be reversed and they can't be reviewed other than hypothetically through a constitutional amendment. If the goal is to keep judges out of our most important but not resolved social, cultural, legal issues, the only answer is Judge Bork's original answer, which is judges can only strike down laws when there is an absolute clear inconsistency. And what a coincidence that that was Alexandra Hamilton's answer as well. It should be our answer today, but no originalist judge that I know of other than maybe Judge Wilkinson of the Fourth Circuit has adopted that perspective. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Ilan. Uh, very, very interesting. And I think we've got a lot of uh, fodder here. We've got a couple of people who've already got their hands up. Um, we're gonna go to Q and A here, but I'm gonna exercise the uh, moderator's privilege to to ask a, a question to each of my panelists here, but um, please do raise your hand and, and um, no doubt, well, no doubt they'll be stumped by my questions and it'll take a whole <laughs> half hour to, to answer them. But if there's any time left, we'll definitely get to the audience. Um, but before we do that, I've been told that we have a poll for audience participation. We've got a couple questions. So before I ask my first question to Elon, I think that the uh, magic people behind the scenes are gonna put up some poll on your screen. There it is. And uh, you have to vote on that. Uh, I guess we have, is this just, this is either both questions. Uh, I think it may be both questions. So vote on these two questions. And as Alon answers um, the question, we'll get all the votes going and then uh, we'll get to see the answers to, um, uh, we'll get to see the answers to these after Alon. Well, after, how about after Alon? And I think those are both questions. So we'll get to see those answers after they answer these first questions. So Alon, um, now that you've been distracted by that first question, you're probably trying to figure it out in your head. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, you mentioned the, your uh, uh, then dean, now Justice uh, Kagan's uh, kind of famous or infamous or however you say it. That we're all textualists now. I actually was there when she said that. Um, that was at, I think it was at the uh, Harvard 
uh, FedSoc thing, and she was there, and she gave that, and, and I, I think I thought she was being a little sarcastic at the time, but uh, when I actually heard it in person, but it's become uh, famous, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of truth to it, too, I think, is that um, in some sense, we are all Texas slash originalists now, um, and maybe we always were in a sense that, you know, a lot of decisions, I mean, it's kind of the idea of law, but in some sense, but it's, it's different than that, too. You know, we've got the in the Heller case, for instance, which is a famous, uh, obviously a famous uh, uh, case about originalism, you've got both sides are, are, are purporting at least to apply originalism, right? So you got, and then you, now you've got uh, Justice Barrett um, on the court, an originalist textualist. Um, so you, it's, it's, you're getting awful close to a majority of justices who profess to be originalist uh, textualists on the, on the court. And given th these developments, there's a lot to be said for the fact that, I mean, we, you know, originalism has really been mainstreamed and it's, it's the mainstream um, uh, constitutional and, and, and textual uh, and statutory interpretation. But then you've got Bostick, right? You've got Bostick sort of, um, and you've got Justice Gorsuch's um, decision from June that, you know, brings to mind a little bit of what Eric was talking about. You feel a little bit, feels a little bit like, if you think about, Justice Scalia, if he'd still been on the court, it's very, very difficult to think that Justice Scalia would have been where uh, Justice Gorsuch was. Is you'd probably be there with another originalist textualist, Justice Kavanaugh. And so you've got the, you know, whether you look, think about Justice Scalia or whether you'd prefer to just look at the difference between Kavanaugh and, and Gorsuch, you know, that, that decision, there was a lot of celebration that, you know, there was, there was textualist decisions on both sides. But given something like that, I mean, it, it starts to feel a little bit like um, like textualism, originalism it has a certain amount of malleability. You know, I, I, I think Eric was making a similar point when he was saying that, you know, you look at where the justices were and it sure seems like they, they tend to come out in a certain way uh, based on what, what we at least think their personal views might be. And so I guess the question I've got is, I mean, in some sense, we are all textless originalists now. I mean, I mean, that's that's sort of just a basic understanding of what it means to be law. And as you said, if we don't treat the text that way, we treat opinions that way. But doesn't something like Bostick and some of these other cases, doesn't it sort of seem to indicate that maybe that's a necessary but not sufficient thing? That something else is important, something else is doing the work. I mean, you mentioned, I think, you talked about um, a about self-government and liberty as these two principles that are kind of undergird the constitution. But I mean, I think you could come up with other, other principles, right? You could come up with a long list, a long or short list. Um, and to what extent should we be interpreting, yes, looking to the original meaning, looking at textualism um, of these, whether we're talking about a constitutional text or a statute, but also like looking at the principles that undergird those things. Um, wh why, why does that not make a difference? Because it sure seems like it makes a difference even amongst originalist textless sometimes. Oh, that's uh, a, doozy, a doozy of a question. Um, so I, I will say, you know, they, they keep repeating, people keep repeating this, um, uh, we're all textualists now, and it's sort of true, but it's not really true. I mean, in the sense that they can't completely ignore the text. I mean, it used to be you could have a First Amendment opinion and the First Amendment was never cited. Now it's usually cited. I mean, not always. Right. But again, the difference between a textualist slash originalist. And for the record, I don't think there's a difference between the two. I think Eric suggested that there was and I'd be interested to hear more. But I think it's the same method applied to different texts. I think it's I think it's a, a, it's the same thing for a textualist and originalist. The public meaning, the original public meaning of the text or the statute, when knowable, is dispositive is just positive, subject to maybe some rule of stare decisis, right? You know, if there are reliance interests or things like that. But for the non-originalists, it's a starting point. And if they don't like what it says in particular, then they move on and, and, and say something else. And, and so, so, so that's the difference, right? How dispositive is the original meaning? And so I, I don't think they're all textualists now. <clears throat> I think they all give more uh, attention to the text. And I think that's, that, that's certainly fair. But the other important thing to say here is, even if we all agree on methodology, it doesn't mean people are going to agree. It doesn't mean judges won't have disagreement, right? People disagree. Originalism is not a legal process theory of law. It is not this theory of law that, that posits that if you get nine justices in a room long enough to hash things out, all originalists will all arrive at the same answer. No, I mean, people disagree even applying the same method for all numbers of reasons, right? Difficulty in interpreting evidence, 
um, reasoning ability, all sorts of things, right? People could in good faith be doing the same enterprise and not always agree. But I think a lot of the times they will narrow the range of disagreement if, if they all adopt the methodology. And, and the range will be much narrower than if you adopt a living constitutionalist uh, approach. Uh, so as for Bostock, I don't know exactly how to care. I don't, I don't know that I would characterize that as a difference in, in ap applying originalist methodology. I do think they had three different conceptions in that case of what originalism required. Maybe I'm a bit unfair to Justice Alito here, but he seemed to want to get into the minds uh, of, of, of the drafters in 1964 and what would they have thought about this, which I think it was just kind of the way he wrote it. It's, but that's not the right question, right? The question is what they wrote. And it doesn't matter what they would have thought about something that they didn't think about or didn't conceive of, right? What matters is what they wrote. The real debate was between the Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Gorsuch opinion, where Justice Gorsuch had a very literalist reading of the text. He parsed every, every word and it says, look, uh, if sex is a motivating factor in the discrimination, then, then it's unlawful under, under, under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Well, you can't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation without also discriminating in part on the basis of, of sex. Therefore, sex is a motivating factor in the discrimination. Ergo, uh, it, you know, sex, sexual orientation discrimination violates Title VII. And Justice Kavanaugh, I think rightly, I mean, I'm still on the fence on who's, who's right about this, but I think Justice Kavanaugh had the better of the argument where he said, look, that's not what we mean when we say textualism or original public meaning. We don't mean we parse the literalistic meaning of every word. The question is, when that was communicated, what was the idea intended to communicate? What do people understand when you hear discrimination on the basis of sex? And you understand that, well, you discriminated against someone because you don't like men or you don't like women, not because you don't like a specific type of man or a specific type of woman, right? And that was Justice Kavanaugh's argument. And it's a slight difference in methodology. Right. And and I think his is probably more faithful to what originalism is. You know, even Justice Barrett, she had this whole speech um, at Case Western about how literalism is not textualism. Right. Um, and so that's what I would say about all that. As for principle, you know, I certainly think it's OK to look at the purpose for which text was written to help inform the meaning. People write texts for a purpose. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we're bound by what they wrote. All right. Well, uh, so, Eric, is it, is he is he right uh, or or was my concern legitimate? Um, well, first of all, we have to make sure we recognize the difference between statutory interpretation and constitutional interpretation. Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Alito all had the same job. What did Congress intend? What Congress, and that, that's not debatable. I mean, that's what statutory interpretation is. What did they intend? Whether you characterize that as what did they communicate or what does that intend? I don't care, it's the same. It doesn't matter for my argument. That is a moment in time um, with one body, the Congress, and we're trying to figure out what they meant. Originalism is very different. We have to go back to 1868. We have to go back to 1789 to do originalism, unless, of course, as Awan says, social understandings can let judges depart from original meanings and original application, original applications, excuse me. Um, and, and, then, and, and, and then we don't have to go by original meaning, I guess, or original application if social understandings change. Of course, social understandings always change and anybody can point to all kinds of things. I don't understand Elon's last argument. We know that in 1868, the original public meaning of the 14th Amendment was that women did not get equal rights. It's not debatable. They didn't get the right to vote for 40 more years. They were the property of their husbands. They couldn't be lawyers in Illinois. 70 years later, they couldn't be bartenders in Michigan. If you are an original public meaning person, you have to ask for a constitutional amendment for women to get equal rights. There is no other way. There just, there just is no other way unless, and I'll go back to textualism, one does what I do with the 14th Amendment. No state shall deny to any person the equal protection of the law. I don't care what they meant. If they meant that women were unequal, which they did, they used the wrong language. So when a state funded institution like VMI, which is incredibly elite and prestigious and is run by the state of Virginia, says, women, you can't enroll here, you're excluded. There's no question that's constitutional as Justice Scalia argued under original public meaning. It's not even a close call. That's obviously constitutional. But under a pure textualist reading, well, wait a minute. The law setting up VMI 
are laws of the state of Virginia. And they are, in fact, denying equal protection to women who don't get the same benefits to become officers in the military as men who enroll in VMI. That is a literal, literal definition of a denial of the equal protection of the laws. Now, Elon might, may argue, as Chris Green does, that's not what equal protection meant. That's fine. Use different words. I want to say one minute about Justice Kagan. It's really important. At her confirmation hearing, she said, we're all originalists now. But that was the end of the power graph. <laughs> that's the phrase, that's the, that's the cliche that gets repeated by originalists today. That was the end. The first couple of sentences were, where the framers were specific, we have to follow the rules laid down. Where they were general, then we do something else, which he didn't identify. And that's why we're all originalists now. And she's right. The president has to be 35. If the Messiah comes back or comes or whatever, and he or she is 30 and she's 33, she can't be president. I'm sorry. What abridging freedom of speech means, what establishment of religion means, what equal protection, due process, cruel and unusual punishments mean cannot be constrained by going back in time especially if social understandings are allowed to change original applications. I, I'll say it again. If you want to constrain judges, you have to make them defer as Alexander Hamilton wanted them to do. All righty, Ilan, do you have any, uh, do you want to, just, I mean, if, if, if you're going to respond, we want to, we want to get some feistiness going here. So if you yeah, just, any, and I know we have some questions, but I, just one, one pushback on that. Um, a lot of people think that the Constitution is written in these, you know, glittering generalities, you know, uh, uh, these majestic generalities. Uh, and when they're broad and open ended, we can't but import modern extra textual values into the text. And but the reality is the Constitution is actually not that broad. It's terms. It's the 35 years to be president. Right? That is not the only specific term. Protection of the laws. Read Chris Green's work, or even better, read my book where I talk about this. It's coming out tonight again. The protection of the laws was actually a narrow concept. It was government protection against private invasion of private rights, right? It was the life, they had to protect your enjoyment and exercise of your life, liberty, and property rights against private interference. They had to give you judicial remedies. Mob violence was the key thing that violated the protection of the laws. Due process of law. If it's substantive due process, if it means whatever is fair, then sure, it's broad and open-ended. But I don't think that's the correct original understanding. It was a procedural due process of law. And the Privileges or Immunities Clause, same thing. I argue it had this specific meaning about anti-discrimination, necessary and proper clause. It was a grant of implied powers, not great and, and substantive powers, right? Uh, so that's specific. ridiculous. What you just said is ridiculous. Oh, my God. Go ahead. Come you on. First. No, 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 go, go ahead. Go ahead. You Unnecessary and proper? All right. First of all, the Constitution is full of specific clauses. None get litigated, which is why I said at the beginning, this, what I'm talking about, and maybe we are talking past each other. I'm talking about the moment in time when a judge has to decide whether to overturn a law. Now, at that moment in time, 99.8% of cases that get to federal court will involve imprecise language with contested histories. The history that Elon just gave you about the 14th Amendment may be right or it may be wrong. Nobody thought that was true into the 1990s. Nobody. That's why he says nobody under 60, uh, nobody over 60 would agree with him because no one thought that. So, and as we know, most historical questions are debatable. Although women having equal rights in 1868 is not one of them, but most are debatable. So your honor, the point I really want to make here is if we're talking about what Chris Green talks about, which is what the constitution means in classrooms and and lecturers and debating societies, that's one thing. But your honor, when you're called to strike down a law, I would hope that you, now you have to follow the Supreme Court. But if you were on the Supreme Court, I would hope that you would say, listen, plaintiff, you show me exactly where in the text this clearly violates the text. Because I'm not elected, I hold my job for life, and you can't do anything about me unless I commit a crime or a high crime or misdemeanor. I would hope you would say to the plaintiff, show me exactly where it's... Elon never mentioned whether he agreed with me that Times versus Sullivan, Reynolds versus Sims, Shelby County versus Holder, most of Citizens United, Department of Montana Revenue from last term, 
the Janus case, and even Steel Seizure were all wrongly decided and are really, really sinister, um, even though I might like the results in some of those cases, sinister uses of powers by judges who are going beyond the oath that they take to only strike down laws when they violate the Constitution, and we would hope that would mean clearly violate the Constitution. Sorry, didn't mean to get upset, but necessary and proper is in Article 1, Section 8. It is a grant of power to Congress, not a limit of Congress's power. I love it. I love it. I agree with half of those cases that you mentioned, by the way. Show then, me. You're not, then you're not an originalist. Then you're not an originalist. No, 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 no. Shelby County was wrong. That was not an originalist decision. Yeah. One no. person, one vote? I, one person, one vote is also wrong because the 14th Amendment protects civil rights, not political okay. rights. Okay. Paying union dues is speech? I'm not a First Amendment expert, and I... The answer is no. The answer is no, but, 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 but Thomas said that, you know, Thomas and, and Gorsuch said that it was. Yeah, I can't right, no, let me, I, let me jump in here, gentlemen, uh, because, uh, not because I, I, I want to actually like see if I can get you guys more feisty here. So, uh, so I'm going to ask, I'm gonna ask uh, Eric a question. But, you know, I think I'm going to do before we do that is uh, get the answer to our poll uh, just to see if we can throw Eric off a little bit like by, while he's thinking about this so he can't answer the question. And what Green Power... Green Power Ranger was obviously yeah, the big Lebowski. I love it. Um, why didn't I get it? Why didn't I get a poll about who I should be? Um, and the Green Power Ranger. <laughs> All right. You're neutral, Your Honor. You're neutral. It's a good look. <laughs> All right. So we're going to. So this actually, my question for you, I actually scrapped my original question, Eric, because um, I'm not sure that you actually uh, would disagree with my original question. So uh, based on some stuff you said, but, but what you did say sort of triggered another question. So. Um, and this actually has to do with, you know, I've only been a judge for less than a year now, but um, two, uh, two areas. First of all, if you were to go back and look at like speeches I gave, which I had to turn over to the Senate Judiciary Committee, so they're public, um, about when I was running for the, for the Montana state court system, I, I said a lot of the same stuff you say about deference here. So I think we, we, there's probably a lot of common ground there. At least there was until before I got life tenure. Um, but uh, so, but. I, I have always been a little bit uh, skeptical about um, this, so this concept of, of just being very deferent, uh, having a lot of deference to the elected branches as a practical matter. Talk to me a little bit about the practical matter because you, I think you said text and history can't constrain judges, very debatable. I think that's a big part of the debate, but you said only deference can constrain judges. Two areas that we got a lot of here on the Ninth Circuit, EPA, which, uh, EPA, uh, which is habeas, uh, so, so federal court review of state court judgments, uh, state court criminal uh, convictions, uh, Congress deliberately made that so that it would be supposedly, and the Supreme Court has said, so Congress and Supreme Court agree, need to be extremely deferential in that area, right? And um, that's something I did a lot of as, as, as a uh, state, in the state attorney general's office. Something I didn't do a lot of, but it's been a real learning curve for me, is the immigration context, Real ID Act, um, review of what the uh, federal executive branch has done with regard to immigration issues. Again, Congress uh, tried to make that very deferential. My personal experience is it doesn't feel very deferential here uh, in, in, uh, in the federal court sometimes in those areas. So does deference, does this concept of yours, does it work at all? I mean, you're, I think what you're saying is originalism doesn't work. And at least originalism, you know, your average, your average non-lawyer would say, you know, if I tell somebody something, you know, there is some meaning to that. And, and if they actually will try to follow what I say, they will, um, you know, it will correct, it will create some, it'll, it'll have, it'll, it'll constrain in some sense. But if you don't trust that to constrain, how do you, how do you trust the paper tiger of deference to constrain those of us that have, that are put on the courts for life and don't seem to care what the rest of anybody else thinks anymore? Uh, thank you for asking those questions, Your Honor. They're really good. And whenever I give my talk to judges, they ask, they ask that question. They really do. <laughs> Um, and, I, and I appreciate it. So first, all my colleagues aren't very deferential. I want to be there, but none of my <laughs> colleagues do. Um, first of all, I do not advocate for deference of any kind in the fourth, fifth, sixth, and eighth amendment context. And I made that clear at the outset. Whether somebody's rights to self-incrimination, double jeopardy, um, whether a confession was, you know, all that stuff, that's where we trust judges and lawyers. That's where we have to. That's where the legal system has to play a major role. So, um, I don't think judges, I never argued that judges have to be deferential 
in most of the areas involving criminal procedure. Um, now, as far as immigration goes, I, I like, can I tell a quick Judge Posner story? Because he, he and I are very close friends. And um, he, <laughs> you're talking about immigration. One of the biggest fights we ever had, he and I, was about immigration and deference. Because Judge Posner's view, publicly stated, retired Judge Posner's view was, I'm not going to defer to those immigration judges because they're terrible. And they, the, 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 the executive branch, quote, immigration judges. They just stamp deported, deported, deported. They don't take it seriously. Why would I be differential to them? Which is a fair observation of Illinois. I don't know what Montana or California is like, but in Illinois, I think his, his criticism of the immigration judges were fair. But I said to him, then get Congress to change the laws. Well, you're, you're being deferential because Congress told you to be deferential. This is not a constitutional issue so much. This is more statutory and very complicated, right? Statutory interpretation questions. And what, what you're being bound to do is something Congress told you, unless you think that's unconstitutional, which he didn't, then you have to do what Congress said. He didn't like that answer, but you have to do what Congress said. So your honor, my answer to you is, if Congress instructs you to be deferential and that does not violate the constitution in your good faith sense, then you have to be deferential. You, you, you can't overrule Congress. That's what we have voters to do. So the last thing I want to say is, no, I live in a fantasy world. Judge Bork lived in a fantasy world, which he eventually came to realize. So my constitutional law jurisprudence as a whole is the following. I'm a legal realist from the 1920s, 1930s. Um, and, uh, either Tell us why Ginsburg and Sotomayor always vote liberal and Alito and Thomas always vote conservative, which has nothing to do with text and history, but their politics and values. They should put, like Judge Posner did, like Justice Kennedy did a lot of the time, put your values in the opinion. Justice Kennedy's four gay rights opinions were just short on doctrine and full of dignity and all kinds of grandiose phrases because he was being honest. The only thing I can ask you to do, Your Honor, given constitutional laws that exist today, is to be honest with me. Because the truth is, unless the Supreme Court has put a precedent on top of your head, in any open-ended constitutional law case, you can vote for either party on not any ground, but many grounds. And that's true whether you're an originalist, a living constitutionalist, or some hybrid, which is what I am, kind of a hybrid. Deference is a fantasy. Because it's a fantasy, I want honesty. Oh, so, no, I and I and I'm I'm a big fan of honesty too, but Alon, uh, so he so I think I think Eric's answer was a little bit of a non-answer instead of, and, and since I said I get that you're you don't think that, that originalism um, constrains very well, but how does this deference as a practical matter in the real world constrain? I think Eric kind of um, uh, okay, we got we got a vote coming up here, but don't let that distract from my question. Um, I think I think he said, well, I think he kind of said, I don't know that that's going to constrain either judges. But uh, so maybe you can say why you think uh, it will constrain more, why you think originalism will constrain more than this concept of of deference of deference that we need to be deferential. Yeah, the the first thing I would say is Eric, how do I get invited to give talks to judges? <laughs> Yes, anyway, I would, yes, if, if, if that invitation is transferable, I would love uh, <laughs> to take that from you uh, next year. Well, so I don't know uh, that originalism and deference are too different, right? The question is, when is deference warranted? And the answer is, on many questions, the Constitution doesn't actually speak, right? They, they doesn't actually speak. And so the question should be left to the democratic process. Is that deference? I don't think that's deference. That's just you come to the conclusion that the constitution doesn't compel one, you know, an answer one way or another. Now, maybe there's a situation in which, okay, look, we actually really don't know the answer. It's a really close call. There's evidence going both ways, right? Um, I have a 55% confidence that what Congress has done or what a state has done is unlawful or unconstitutional, but I really could be wrong about this. Well, then we have two options, right? And it depends on your threshold of confidence, right? Uh, and one option is to say, look, because I'm not totally confident about this conclusion, uh, we, we can defer to the legislature, call it the presumption of constitutionality. What doesn't necessarily make sense to me is that we say, well, a presumption of liberty. If we don't know, then let's just presume that the government can't do it. 
right? That's the quote unquote libertarian presumption. And, and I just don't understand why that's necessarily right. The founders cared about self-government and about liberty, right? Uh, but the point is, uh, in those instances, deference might be called for as, as a tiebreaker, as an interpretive tiebreaker, because you, you're just not perfectly, it's not, you're not confident enough. And so you'll, you'll defer to the legislature uh, in that sense. Uh, but that, you know, that's the only way in which I think deference should sort of uh, uh, play a role. Um, Wait a minute, but, but Alon, sorry to interrupt, but Elon, you do admit that deference was what the idea was in 1789. I mean, it just was. The prisoners' cases, Alexander Hamilton, um, Edmund Randolph, I mean, they all talked about this new power of judicial review as being a great power that they're going to use modestly, humbly, and really what they, and, and, and McGinnis says it's, it's kind of a clarity requirement, but if it's 5545, Alexander Hamilton, we know what he would have said. Let the law go. I mean, you have to be really sure. Irreconcilable variance. It, well, originalism without difference is not originalism. No, I don't know. I don't know because when you say, 50, if I have 55% confidence, I can have 55% confidence that there's an irreconcilable difference between this law and the constitution, right? It's, that's just a confidence threshold, right? I don't, I don't, when they say clear error, when they say manifest error, I mean, I don't know that that means you have to be 90% certain. I think you could potentially be, I'm 51% certain that this violates this constitutional provision, right? But so I think that the confidence threshold is different than these, well, these phrases where they say manifest versus clear or things like that. But what I will say is it's sort of a red herring to say, oh, only two federal statutes were ever struck down in Marbury v. Madison and Dred Scott. Well, they struck down tons and tons of state laws. Why? Because back then states did most of the legislature most of the legislating and Congress just didn't do very much. Wait a minute, I didn't make that argument. Who are you talking to? You, you can't, you're not allowed to use 1835 to discern the original public meaning of 1789. See, that's the problem, Judge. That's the problem right there. Either it's original public meaning at time of ratification, which is what almost all originalists today say it is, or it's not. And the original public meaning of the Constitution, the original Constitution, unamended, has to be the 1789 meaning. Otherwise, it's not the original meaning. It's the evolving meaning, and by definition. Well, I love this, guys. I, 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 gotta, I gotta stop it only because, well, A, I wanna see what the answer to my poll is um, that they put out, but B, we've only got uh, a few more minutes. Judge Judy, that's, yeah, I'm, that's, that hurts <laughs> uh, a little bit. But uh, so we've got some attendees here. We, I, I, we, I don't wanna uh, cut them off from being able to ask some questions. We don't have a long time, so. Um, let's just try to answer. Uh, I will. I will pick one of you here in a second, and then ask your question. Try to ask it in, you know, uh, twenty to thirty seconds or something. Make sure there's a question mark at the end of that. So what I'm going to do is I will click on your on on your um, on, on the person's hand that's up, and um, once you once you speak, make sure you turn your mute off. If you're on the phone, press star nine, and we'll see if we can make this work. All right, we'll start with Susan. Layman, Susan, you're on. I think you're muted, Susan. This better? There you go. Okay, hi. So first off, um, very much have enjoyed this session. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Susan Layman. I live in central Pennsylvania. I am not an attorney or a law school student. Um, I am a, a tremendous lover of American history and a citizen who cares a lot. Um, I, I found I had a point of agreement with both of you. Um, so I definitely, I, I liked the general overall approach of, uh, of Eric, of basically the law itself is innocent until proven guilty, seemed to be kind of what you were saying, uh, if I'm interpreting that correctly. And also agree very much in terms of Citizen United. I, I agree in terms of the movie factor, but I, I think... Um, in general, I feel that the corporations as human beings with the same rights gets into very dicey territory. I mean, does Twitter have the right to bear arms? All right, Susan, this is this is Judge Van Dyke, but we got you know we need disagreement. Okay. But tell us what you disagree about and give us a question to get one of these guys riled up. Okay, well, and, and I agree. I'll quickly. I agree with uh, with uh, Ilan in terms of the um, meaning versus application, and I'm wondering. 
I'm thinking that some, some good knowledge, not just of the writings on the law of the founding fathers, but knowledge of what they were going through in history can sometimes inform that meaning. My example for that is there's arguments you hear, you know, casually, I don't know how formally it goes, but that with the Second Amendment, well, you know, back in those days, we had muskets, you had muskets, you know, it, it wasn't, that's what they were talking about. But if you know a little point of history, you know that the rifling inside long guns, which is where the term rifle comes from, I don't know if it was invented in Pennsylvania, or, um, but it, it was demonstrated to George Washington for the first time in the camp in Boston in the first battle of the Revolutionary War. So the idea that the founders would not have realized that tremendous technological advances would happen is is just not not right. realistic they but, absolutely uh, knew that I'm they would on you but what's your question because we're running out of time just i mean would you would you agree with that as a reasonable argument no that, that of history no. <laughs> yes no no eric come on no my, no <laughs> wait, wait, wait a minute whatever george washington had while crossing the potomac is a water gun compared to AK-47s. And the only relevant question based on social understandings is if you ask them, do you know that someday someone could shoot a thousand people in 15 minutes from a roof, um, then would you, what would you want about gun rights is a nonsensical, absurd, ridiculous question to ask about the original public meaning of the constitution in 1789. They would have no way of answering that question. And if you think they have a way of answering that question, I gotta get you some medicine because they don't. Uh, obviously, obviously, you know, two things to say, history does matter, right? Uh, the historical background, the purposes for which their texts matter. Uh, and quite frankly, that's why they wrote the constitution the way they did. They didn't write, you have the right to keep and bear muskets. They didn't write, uh, you have the right to speak your thoughts on quill and parchment, and you have the right to be secure in your carriages. Straw man, Elon, that's all straw man. I'm not, no one's arguing the First Amendment doesn't apply to the internet or the Second Amendment applies to AK-47s if you accept that individual rights interpretation. The question is how, not does it, but how does it apply to AK-47? That's the question. So no. I guess we don't just, I don't, you said no, I said yes. I'm not sure we actually disagree about her point though. No, 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 Judge, I'm sorry. This is really important. We don't get, I mean, Heller was a one out case, but the hundreds, thousands of lower court cases involving gun rights involving today's guns. You need, you need a permit to carry them. Can nonviolent felons have them? What do we do with when we eventually get nuclear weapons that can be you know, shot out of a pistol? All of those questions cannot be answered by historical approach to 1789. To I don't know. Say, to say that it can is nonsense. I don't know that that's true. And I've done some work on this. I've got a paper on, on the police powers uh, in the Chicago Law Review where I've not extrapolated this yet to the First and Second Amendment, but I think they understood that states had a broad police power to protect the health and safety of the people. And what would an infringement of the right to bear arms be? Well, if it was a reasonable police regulation, a truly legitimate for the health and safety, or in this case, safety, it wouldn't be an infringement. Just like I thought Wisconsin saying all felons don't get to own guns and judges and then, are striking it down. A lot of voting to strike it down. Well, because, yeah, it's obvious because how is telling a nonviolent felon that he or she can't own a gun, how is that legitimately for He's public? a felon. That's not a legitimate a police felon. power purpose, Eric. How are we going to distinguish between violent and nonviolent felons on the borderline cases? That's absurd. All right, I love it, you guys. I, I love it. Um, but we, we only have five minutes left. I do want to get another question so that maybe they'll invite me back and you guys back. But let me mention one thing before that. You notice that Susan... Um, had stuff to agree with. So your next book should be a joint book um, where you guys can both, uh, 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 well, I guess agree and disagree in the book. So we're going to, um, we're going to go to Joy next because you're next in my queue. Joy, I'm going to, Joy Stavely, uh, 20 seconds. Ask your question in 20 seconds, if you don't mind. We're going to open it up to you. Make sure you unmute. Can you hear me now? Yep. All right. So I, I'm also not an attorney or a law student, but I, I'm just, my question is, isn't the bottom line that the court is not to make law and that if society wants to change the law, they need to pass an amendment? Isn't that the bottom line? All right. That, I could that, not that, have said it better myself. I agree. hundred percent. What do you think, Elon? 
Yeah, no, I, I, I think that I think that's exactly right. And I don't know. I mean, I think Eric maybe is being a little flippant with that question, because the question is, what are the sources of law? Where does this content of our constitutional legal obligations come from? Is it the paper, the words on the paper in the National Archives, as it's been properly amended? Or does the law come from the judicial opinions or some other sources of law? Uh, and your instinct is absolutely right, that it's the Constitution, so long as it's legitimate and binding for the reasons I've suggested, as it's been properly amended, and, and that's it. Yeah, as Judge Bork said, unless there is something in the Constitution clearly prohibiting a law, the law should stand. Next. All right. Well, uh, we're going to go to Adam. Boy, Adam, I can't say your last name, but uh, X-I-E, Zai, Z. So we're going to allow you to talk here and uh, make sure you unmute yourself and make it a nice quick question like our last questioner. Go ahead, Adam. Hello, Mr. Worman. I have a question for you. In your BYU Law Review article, The Original Understanding of, Constitu of Constitutional Legitimacy, you mentioned that there are three kinds of originalists. Those who favor respectively, presumption of lecture rights, democratic enhancement through judicial activism, and presumption of self-government and judicial constraint. Here in the debate, you just mentioned the balance between the natural rights and um, judicial constraint and self-government, but you didn't really mention the second one. And uh, Professor Seagal worries that the current originalists, justice and practitioners have essentially merged into one group from three groups that you mentioned. That is political conservatives in disguise who have found social conservative values for judicial activism and minority rule. In this regard, how would you counter Professor Seagal's argument? And finally, for both professors, what would be your advices for law students who fail to be an originalist because they're inspired by the founders' philosophical and institutional enterprise? Thank you. Thank you, Adam. So, kick it off. Yeah, uh, I have nothing to say on the third point. I just more power to you and keep it up. But as to the first question, you'll note that I did not rely heavily on the popular sovereignty argument. Indeed, because the popular sovereignty argument is the most flawed argument, right? Because the founders are correctly criticized for being all white, all male. Half of them were uh, slave owners and many of them were landowners, right? And so I do think popular sovereignty was necessary to set the constitution in motion, but I don't think that's what, and Jefferson thought that the popular sovereignty every 19 years Right, had to keep the constitution in motion. But I'm a Madisonian and a Burkean on this point. That's where this debt against the living, to keep the constitution in motion. I don't think you need these acts of popular sovereignty. We, the people today, have to continue accepting and recognizing it that it meets this threshold for legitimacy, name, namely this balance between self-government and liberty. I don't think this popular sovereignty, that was the Jeffersonian argument. I don't think it's necessary today. We, the people today, as, as, as a matter of what HLA Hart might call the rule of recognition, as a matter of positive social facts, have to recognize the Constitution as our law for these reasons, because it balances self-government and liberty. But popular sovereignty, I, I argue, is only necessary to set it into motion. And I said that really, really fast but we're running out of time and there's much more to be said. Eric. I'll just, I think Adam might be a student at Georgia State. So I want to just, I want to, uh, I'm not positive, but I think he might be uh, not one of mine yet, but so I want to make that clear. Um, I, if you're a student who wants to be an originalist, I strongly recommend that you put on the critical thinking hat that Ilan teaches you to do and that I, I try to teach you to do and then read Scalia's and Thomas's opinions, all 200 of them or something that strike down state and federal laws and when you read decisions like Seminole Tribe versus Florida or um, Prince versus New York or all these federalism decisions that have no basis, none in text or history, you will see that even self-avowed originalist judges end up not being original. Um, and and I, I won't have to teach you that. You'll see that yourself. Uh, Citizens United couldn't be less originalist. Thomas and Scalia both signed on. And judge, when someone said at the founding, corporations only had the rights that states gave them, which is a factual historical certainty. Justice Stevens said that in dissent in Citizens United. Corporations only have the rights that states give them as an original matter. Scalia's response was, well, even if that's true, the role of corporations has changed in our country over time. Ilan has said like 14 times tonight, evolving over time, all those kinds of social understandings, all those words. It gives the whole game away. There is no longer a difference. Judge Bork is dead. 
There is no longer a difference between living constitutionalism and originalism. And all I ask is they admit it. Be honest about it and tell us why you're deciding cases the way you're deciding cases. Well, I, you guys, this has been great. We are at our 6.30, but I'm going to give each of you 30 seconds to sort of sum up. And, and Alon, you, you'll start. And uh, Eric, you can, since you had to go uh, second last time, you can go at the beginning. You can go second now. I apologize to all the people that were queued up to ask questions. Um, a fantastic audience and a fantastic uh, panelists tonight. And at the very end of it, I will, um, I guess, announce that we've uh, uh, some stuff that's coming up. But let's let's uh, take a minute. Alon, you got 30 seconds or so, and then Eric, you get the last word. Yeah, nothing in particular to say other than Eric is absolutely right about Shelby County. Conservatives sometimes get things wrong, but he's wrong about Seminole Tribe. Uh, I will say all the sovereign immunity cases uh, aren't weren't correctly reasoned, but the result is actually correct uh, and and they're defensible. And um, I recommend uh, Bradford Clark's article on on the Eleventh Amendment uh, in particular for that. Um, and so all I'll say is, look, conservatives sometimes get things wrong. Libertarians sometimes get things wrong. Originalists sometimes get things wrong. But getting things wrong is a, is a lower order problem. It is not a higher order question of, of the, the validity of the methodology. I, I just want to say thank you to the Federalist Society for having me. I'm kind of a visitor here. Um, but the point I want to make is that in 1987, the Federalist Society would have loved me and invited me to every single thing they did. Um, and that's an interesting evolving of the Federalist Society over time. And then one very last thing, uh, the 11th Amendment to the Constitution says for relevant purposes that no state can be sued by a citizen of quote, another state. And the textualists on the court, the textualists on the court said the word another means the same. For you non-lawyers out there, that bit of magic that another can mean the same is what unfortunately judges both liberal and conservative moderate, in between, all around. They pull that magic all the time. I just want them to do it honestly. That's all. Well, thank you both. Um, I, I don't know. I, 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 I still think you should write the book together and maybe you should <laughs> meld these two doctrines and call it deferential originalism or something like that and uh, your book get famous and rich. Um, we are going to uh, end it here. Thank you very much to my panelists. It was fantastic. Thank you to everybody who attended. We do have, um, I don't think I have a date for when our next uh, uh, fight night uh, or fright night, I guess there won't be a fright night for a year, but our fight night is coming up in about a month, I think. Um, and then also, obviously, the Federal Society has its convention coming up with a lot of, um, a lot of spicy fun panels um, coming up in the, uh, early November, uh, the first, I think, starting November 8th or 9th or something like that. So thank you, everyone. I don't know if there's anything anybody else uh, needs to say, but... Uh, Thank and you, if you Eric. had a question, if you had a question that we didn't get to, we are easy to find, both me and Eric. So feel free to email us. And thanks, Ilan. It was great as always. Thank you, Eric. And thanks, Judge. Thanks, thanks Judge. Gentlemen. You guys have a good night. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm really like enjoying it.